Hello. Oh. You all all right? Yeah, good, thank you. Hi, Malcolm. Yeah, here, here we are again. <laughs> We have lots of people registered today. So I'm going to give them a chance to come in. Let's hope they'll come. Otherwise, they're going to miss out. Hello, everyone. How's it going? All right? Yes, how are you? Yeah, I'm all right, thank you. Good. What's the weather like in sunny Brighton? <laughs> not I'm not in Brighton right now, so I might you'll have to answer that one. Yeah, it's not, not sunny, sunny, unfortunately, no. <laughs> a bit dreary today, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Where are you, Sam? Crawley. Oh, okay. Yeah, we definitely don't have any sunshine. I was going to say, it's always dreary there, isn't it? But I, don't, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> I can say that because I have family there, so it's okay. okay. <laughs> As usual, just a little bit of just a chat, I'm waiting around for people to get themselves organised and get in. A few familiar faces, people that have been on a few sessions. Thank you for coming back and joining us again. If you can have your camera on, that'd be awesome. But obviously you don't have to do. And if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, then go ahead. Also, just a note, if your name isn't correct, um, you're using, you know, shared Zoom or uh, somebody's coming up as MacBook. So if you can just click on the three little dots by your picture, you will be able to rename yourselves and then we can see your real identity. And we're really right, so about halfway there, but um, I do appreciate people might have had other commitments. So hopefully it told you as well when you uh, came into the session, the session is being recorded. Um, they're not going to be released for a while, but um, just let you know that you are being recorded. Thank you, Dave. I think we will get started. Um, if you wouldn't mind just keeping yourselves on mute until the end, and then I'm happy to take as many questions as you have. Um, you can also pop over into the chat. I've got Maddie here today co-hosting from Creative Bloom, and she's going to keep all those questions for me um, until the end, and I'll be able to answer them all for you. So um, this is just an overview of the series. If you haven't been to any of these sessions before, Recover and Rise is um, over 25 different webinar sessions of brilliant digital adoption um, help, really. You know, lots of different topics that are coming up. Um, this series is all the, the customers and marketing side of things. And then we've got some other productivity and system things coming up in the future. So we're on number four of eight. Um, in this series and as you know we're talking about social media and content 
Later in the series, I'm going to be hosting the Visitor Economy Session, and we're going to be hearing from a lovely lady, the owner of the Artisan Bakery, um, a business that has adopted digital during lockdown, um, and then the opportunities and things that that has led to, um, and she'll be sharing our story with us. So if you know, if you are or you know of any, um, you know, visitor economy, tourism type businesses that you think would be interested in that, then please do let them know that we've got that very specific session coming up on the 28th, just for them. So today, yep, we're going to be talking about social media. Um, I am Rachel Dines. Um, I'm a chartered marketer with over 20 years of experience in the marketing industry, and I'm also a business owner. My small business is called Shake It Up Creative. We are a marketing agency in West Sussex, and we specialise in working with companies under five years old, and that's to help demystify marketing and to stop them being inconsistent with their activities. I'm going to be talking about um, social media and uh, well, social media strategy, I should say, and content today. And ideally, you might want to grab some paper as I'm going to give you a few little tasks along the way. So if you just want to take um, a minute to just grab some, some notepads or, or whatever you want to scribble on. The, sli the slides, rather, are going to be shared um, on SlideShare like we normally do and sent out in the next couple of days. Um, but it's quite nice to to be interactive and actually start to build your own strategy whilst you're in the thick of it whilst you're hearing about all the different bits that it needs to include so if you really doubt that your business should be on social media i'm going to start with the numbers 396 minutes was the average daily amount of time spent on the internet by an individual via any device in 2020. Now, I do appreciate we were stuck at home with not much to do. So the stats have been pushed up by what was the, the pandemic in the thick of it when we we're all um, homebound in 2020. But even so, it, it increased by, I think, almost an hour. Um, and so we're still, even previous to that, spending a lot of, of time on the internet. Out of that time, 144 of those minutes are spent on social media by those people that use it. Yep, that's more than two hours a day, um, which is obviously quite a lot of our time. So we love it. And there are 3.78 billion social media users worldwide in 2021. So we're going to have a look and I will talk to you about which platforms are the most popular. Now as this stats table is worldwide, you, you do see the likes of the Chinese video sharing platform Douyin and also China's largest messaging platform WeChat. But the big boys that you would expect here in the UK, um, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram and TikTok, they're all on there too. But notice that number two spot though, YouTube. That channel was, was founded by three former PayPal employees and it's moved from being the go-to place for amateur videos to an absolute goldmine of professional content. Um, it was generating $14 billion, I think it was, in annual ad revenue two years ago. So goodness knows what it is now. And YouTube is the world's second most visited website overall, not just um, amongst social media. <clears throat> now, there's plenty of stats um, to support social media use by businesses too. So shoppers, you know, they look for information on a company, uh, they look for products, they look for special offers in the search engines, but also across social media. Um, they're looking for recommendations, you know, they're asking friends about things. Even if you don't use Facebook, Instagram, or any of the other platforms personally, you or someone associated with your business needs to take on this task. You need to take it onto your company and be consistent with it too. So, of course, it's really important to know that this only applies if your target customers are actually on social media. You know, don't feel that you've just got to have it on the list if it's not something that's relevant. Now, Facebook has a whopping 4.6 billion app downloads over the last 10 years, 
its largest user group is 25 to 34 year olds approximately and 56% of its users are actually male. Now, over on Twitter, 44% of users are aged 30 to 49, so it's slightly higher age group, and only 32% are female. So we've got more men using Twitter. And 71% of Twitter users say that they actually use the network to get their news, and 42% of users have a degree. Now, I'm not giving you all of these stats to, to kind of fill, fill your heads up. You don't have to remember them all, but it's really just to demonstrate that there is a difference in the demographic, in the usage, of the people that are signed up to all of these different platforms. LinkedIn is the place that hosts 65 million decision makers profiles and makes up more than 50% of all social traffic to B2B websites and blogs. LinkedIn is the number one channel that B2B marketers use to distribute digital content and it also stands out, stands apart from other social media companies because it's far less dependent on advertising revenue compared to the likes of Facebook and Twitter. Now, Instagram's highest user group is aged 25 to 34, yet it does compete with TikTok for the younger users, particularly through its Reels feature. Only 25% of te teens prefer Instagram over TikTok now. There's a fairly even split of female and male users on that, um, and it has 200 million business accounts. Companies like Gymshark, Hype and Joe Wicks, The Body Coach, are all companies that were pretty much born on Instagram. But having profiles also adds to your company's search knowledge graph for your SEO too. So despite social content not actually being a ranking factor, and I can explain what that means later if you need to know, um, it's really good to um, add to your credibility, trust and build up the profile of your company's existence on search. Now, we have um, a poll. I'm just going to launch that now so that we can see. Oh, I don't seem to have the one, right one. Hold on just one second. Here we go, social media. So I'm just going to launch this poll now and you can tell me how confident you are about using social media for marketing. And then I'll be asking you again at the end. Hopefully I'll have taught you a thing or two by then and we will get a different set of responses. So if you can just select your answer on the poll, that'd be great. And I'll be able to share that feedback with you as well. So if you want to come in. Come on those that are hiding. Great, okay, thank you very much. So I'm gonna share those results for you and you can see that actually there's not many people here that are already confident. And obviously that's why you're here. Um, lots of people saying that um, their knowledge could be better. So hopefully by the end, that will have completely flipped on his head and you'll all be super confident and happy. Thank you very much for that. So I'm sure you, that you'll know that the latest addition to social media is called Clubhouse. This launched in March last year. It's an invite only um, platform. And for a long time, it was actually only available to people that used um, iOS, so Apple devices. But now it's got over 10 million weekly active users. The Clubhouse is very audio focused. That's the primary um, usage of, of the platform. How it works is all audio based. And it provides a place for real time sharing, stories, collaboration and chats. It offers the ability to connect and engage with professional people that are outside of your industry. So it's much more spontaneous because you've got rooms filled with real time chats on a variety of topics. The focus is on high value conversations rather than prepared, produced content that you tend to find on the other platforms. You create a profile and then you can connect to other social media apps too. And this is how people check you out further through those connections, you know, not just relying on the information that you're kind of presenting yourself with it in Clubhouse. Inside the app, the hallway is the app's main feed and where you discover chat rooms. So you can see an at a glance view of each room, including the name of the room, some of the people that are in the room and the number of people and also the speakers that are in the room. But when you first join a clubhouse room, you join as a listener, a listener, <laughs> listener, a listener. So you join actually without a microphone. And then when you're up to speed with the conversation that's happening in there, you are in, you can raise your hand 
Um, and then the moderator may invite you up onto the, onto the stage to actually speak. Now you can come and go from rooms as you wish. So it's easy to listen in on different conversations, some of which will have celebrities in or high profile members in attendance. And you're encouraged to make new connections as you go along. It's felt quite exclusive due to the way the invite system works, but in the future it will be open to everyone, they say. So when someone joins Clubhouse, they're given one invitation, they can send that to someone using their phone number. This means that members send invitations to people that they have a close connection to, rather than just an acquaintance. And once someone has been on Clubhouse for a while and they spend time moderating rooms and speaking, they can earn themselves more invites to send out. Now there's no ads, the focus is on building your network and raising your visibility and credibility within this space. So why should you use social media? Why should you be on it as a business? Some of these reasons might already match your thoughts, but all of them are important. The last point, however, is really important because it shows that you're going to be sticking around, that you're serious about your business, that you care about being able to communicate with your audience in this way. Obviously, there's the other benefits where you know, you're, you're linking back to your website. So hopefully for sharing valuable content, people want to know more about you. They will click through and you get that traffic. Um, but it also gives you a chance to learn more about your audience as well and engage them in some of the decision making sometimes that you're actually doing as a business. You know, I've known companies that have said um, put content on their social media whilst they're going through a rebrand. And they've said, guys, you know, which logo do you prefer? This one, this one or this one? Or what message do you prefer? And they are getting incredibly valuable insight from their followers and they're voting on those and they're actually able to then use the one that's the most popular, the one that resonates the most. So there's things like that that you can do on social media that you might not have thought about using it for. I'm now going to take you through a seven step social media strategy. So even if you do have social profiles already, you can definitely go back through these steps to ensure that you've covered it all and you can make improvements where you need to. So don't worry if you're already you know, pretty active on the platforms, I'm sure that there'll be something in here that will be of value to you. So the first point I want to make, however, is that your website should be your front door. So it's your core, your, your main place of being, and social media is just one marketing tactic. It's a digital marketing activity that, you know, it helps build your business, business voice and it brings people back to your core. Now, naturally, over time, the landscape changes. You can't guarantee that any particular social media platform will be around forever. We've seen the likes of Google Plus come and go. It doesn't exist anymore. And there have been other names that have been tipped to be the next big thing that have just never really reached the summit. Now, on your own website, you have a lot more control. You can decide what's being published, what people see, and how quickly they see it. Saying that on social media, you essentially have the opportunity there to subliminally get in front of an extra layer of audience, which then with engagement tactics will help build your following. The one way to merge the two outputs is to have a social media feed on your website. This doesn't strictly count as freshly changing content for SEO purposes, but it does give your visitors something new to look at each time they come. And it also provides that reassurance um, that you're active as a business. When, a web, when website visitors see that, it does give them a brief insight into your brand voice as well. And it might just keep them on your site a little bit longer. The other benefit that is often overlooked by smaller businesses is that of having user-generated content displayed on your website. So I'm talking about things like customers showing off those trainers they bought from your store, um, enjoying that amazing sandwich from your cafe, or, think, or thanking you perhaps for helping them find the perfect gift for their mother-in-law. With the right attributions, the world of the happy customer is brought right in front of other potential customers' eyes. So when it comes to engaging with your audience, an Instagram feed can also bring real added visual stimulation to a website, and it is a popular choice for retailers in particular. Now, social media is a form of marketing, as is your website. 
But the difference is, as I've said, you own your website. Now there is an exception. If you have a product or service idea and you, and you want to test the market, then um, you want to work lean and you want to fail fast, then you can use things like Facebook pages, um, for example, as a way of testing that market. You can sell through your Facebook page. You can glean information about your target audience and learn whether your idea has potential or not. It's cheap, it's easy, and it's quick to do it this way. But you must remember at all times that social media needs to be included in your overall marketing strategy, not a singular approach to marketing. It should be used with other things. And also when you're, when you're in conversation online, you, you need to treat other, other people how you wish to be treated. What you're doing on social media is very public. So you should behave with decorum just as you would in, in real life. Posts and responses can be dragged up from the past and you really don't want any effects. So step one, the first part of the strategy is thinking about your social media marketing goals. And it's really important. You don't just want to sign up to all of the platforms regardless, find that they suck the life out of you and then later learn that your audience isn't even present there. Your initial considerations might be, you know, whether you have the time um, or a money commitment. Do you have a reluctance for person, for personally for social media outside of business? If so, it might mean that it's something you need to outsource or delegate. You know, do you have um, the tools or the ability to create the creative side, you know, the imagery for the platforms? Or do you need to schedule some time and budget to get some brand photographs, you know, that you own? You've got those, those creative assets. You also want to make each part of each goal of your goal smart which um, I'm sure you've heard of if you've done lots of business talks before. Um, it stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. And this guides your activity and ensures that it leads to real business results. So these are just examples of a smart goal. You know, we'll, we'll use Instagram Reels, post them twice a week, and get 500 click-throughs by the end of the quarter. Now notice that I said click-throughs there. Things like, number of followers, um, a number of likes, etc. Yes, they're really easy to track, but they're also known as vanity metrics because it's hard to prove their real value. So instead you want to try and focus on things like engagement, uh, click-throughs and conversion rates as well. You might have different goals for your different networks, but whatever you choose should align with your main marketing objectives. So I'm gonna give you a small task now for step one, if you've got some paper, take a couple of minutes and just make some notes on your goals. So how do you want social media to really work for you? Try and form three social media smart goals if you can. Just gonna give you a couple of minutes, okay?
Okay, I can see um, a couple of you have uh, stopped, so hopefully a few of you are done. Um, if you're not, you know, just, just make a note that step one is setting those goals, um, come back to it, and, you know, perhaps you'll need a bit of time to actually make them smart. Um, it, it's hard to do that super fast, so, um, yeah, you can come back to it as fast as time. Okay. And there's lots of considerations when you manage a profile. So things to think about is, you know, the design, um, so your profile header, your profile image, the post images, uh, make sure it's all branded content. It's not just about the channels themselves, but it's also about how you communicate your purpose, you know, your message, your brand and, and how you maintain consistency. You want everything to tie together nicely. You want to know that some of that content if it's just got that, um, you know, like, for example, ours, you know, if we have sprinkles on, then hopefully it would be clear that that content is from us because that's part of our brand and it's a brand asset. You also want to be very sure on your um, response timings as well. So, you know, how quickly are you going to be able to respond to messages from these various social platforms? Make sure that you set an auto respond if it's not going to be immediately all the time. Um, be very transparent you know, about, about all of these things as much as you can so that you're not um, spoiling expectations. So step two, identify your audience. Now, if you get to know your fans, your followers and your customers as real people with real wants and needs, you will know how to target and engage with them on social media. So it's also critical if you want to turn social media followers into customers for your business. Try not to make too many assumptions. Social media analytics can provide a ton of valuable information about who your followers are, where they live, and how they interact with your brand on social media. These insights will allow you to refine your strategy and target your audience in a better way. If you believe that the problem your product or service solves is of high importance in a customer's life, you can ask these three questions to speed the, the persona creation up. Um, if, you, if you're not sure what a customer persona is, then please do ask me at the end. Um, I think there, there have been other sessions that have included this, so hopefully it's something that's clear. But those three questions are, what is the first thing my customer thinks about in the morning? What is the last thing my customer thinks about at night? And why? These questions are all aimed at identifying their pain points. The simple questions could identify the pain points of a typical customer for you. And notice I did say, you know, if you're solving something that is of high importance in, in a customer's life. If it's just a, you know, a small purchase, um, something that's more of a luxury, you know, you're, you're probably not going to get that insight there. But I just think they're brilliant questions to really think about. And if you need to, ask a pool of your customers those questions and try and find out what their pain points are. So again, I've got another small task for you. I want you to make some notes about anything that you already know about your target audience. And then you can leave some space to expand on this later by looking at other data. So looking at the insights, looking at some publicly available data about that type of demographic and making you know some additions to that so write down what you already know about your target audience there's some um, points to guide you on the screen uh, spending power is something that's often overlooked <clears throat> especially <coughs> excuse me if you're in a, um, a b2b business um, environment I, I would say because you need to know who holds the purse strings and what their budgets are for certain um, expenses and purchases. So it's always a good question to ask how much you're willing to spend on this. I'll just give you a couple of minutes to make those notes, okay?
some writing. Hopefully you've got um, a few things jotted down and I will take you on to step three. Step three is about knowing your competition. So a competitive analysis of your competition will help you to find out what their strengths and weaknesses are and how those strengths and weaknesses compare to your own. Now, it's a process of benchmarking your own results so that you can identify opportunities for growth as well as strategies that aren't performing as well as they should. So a social media competitive analysis will help you to identify who your competitors are on social media, know which platforms they're on, know how they're using those platforms, also to understand how well their social strategy is working from what you can see publicly. You can benchmark your social results against the competition. You can identify social threats to your business. You know, what, what's a competitor doing on a, on a platform that is getting huge levels of engagement that, that you're not? You know, are people going to start following their videos, for example, instead of yours? You can also find gaps in your social media marketing strategy. You know, perhaps all your competitors are on a platform that you're not or they're using a feature that you're not. Learning about your competitors is not the only reason to do it either. So it will give you insights into your own business and your audience, which is likely to have an overlap with your competitors' audiences, of course, as well. Now, here are some insights that a social media competitive analysis can give you. Um, you know, you, you, you could, I mentioned the benchmarks, so performance benchmarks, so average number of followers, um, engagement rates and share of voice, ideas for the best times to post on social media, because your audience are, are like, quite likely to be online at a similar time if you're in a direct competitive competition, an understanding of the potential customer pain points as well, and new and perhaps even better ideas for content that might resonate with your, your audience um, or that conversely doesn't resonate with your audience and what you might want to avoid you know if you can see something really isn't going down very well or a, a competitor stopped doing something there's probably a reason behind that an understanding of how to communicate with your audience on certain platforms you know do you need to be more casual or more formal for example and ideas for ways to differentiate your brand now that just kind of harks back to my last session on the brand session. Um, if you need more information on that, you can view the slides before that. Just let me know and I'll get a link over to you. Now, maybe um, one of your competitors is really dominant on Facebook, for example, but they've put little effort into Instagram. You might want to focus on the networks where your audience is underserved rather than trying to win fans away from a dominant competitor. So your task at this step is to note down a few direct competitors to have a look at. Um, there's always going to be companies that are doing a, a similar thing to you in other countries or other parts of, of, of this country even. But try and think what is a direct competitor, you know, a similar size business, um, similar services, you know, in as many ways as possible in line, in line with yours, even if they're not immediately local. Um, take a couple of minutes, write those um, competitors down so that later you can go back and have a look and do a bit of your own analysis. The, the graphic on the screen is, is purely just an example. And I, I just like the bit in the middle where they're actually noting whether someone's got um, a Facebook page or a business profile, whether they've set up a group, same on LinkedIn, whether they're on Pinterest, those kinds of things. Um, that's, you know, always useful when you're doing that audit and that comparison. Just give me a couple of minutes.
Right, so step four of your social media strategy. This is a, about things that you can do to improve your profiles. And I'm sure that there will be several things. If you're on LinkedIn, um, your personal profile does give you a completeness percentage score comes up, which can help identify sections that can be built up. So that's really useful. But the other platforms don't tend to do that. So across those platforms, my general advice would be to look at these things. Complete all the profile fields that are available to you, all those different sections. Remove any dead profiles. Now, what I mean by that is sometimes I have customers and they say, yeah, 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 we're on Twitter. And then I look at their Twitter. They actually haven't tweeted for like three years. Um, it, it's just not of value at all. And if it's not something that they're planning to reinvigorate, then just kill it off. You know, just just get rid of that. Just don't be on Twitter if it wasn't working or you're not engaged with the pro with the platform. Just get rid of it. Um, maybe there's um, former employees, for example, that's still connected in some way to your profile. Sort of, all of that out. Get rid of them. Now, include keywords. Is, including those in your profile is, is a really good idea. Um, and perhaps hashtags as well, depending on which platform you're on, obviously. Keywords is a whole other topic, but if you do want to ask me any questions about that at the end, then, then let me know and I can help you with how to identify those. Um, I'd also say be really consistent with your branding. You know, I did mention before about um, how important it was for that to be a consideration on your, on your profiles. Um, make sure that you're not just throwing up a logo that's the wrong size and it's all squished and it just looks terrible. Um, make sure that it's matching you know across across the platforms um, use high quality images as well that follow the recommended dimensions for each platform i'll be sharing some tools at the end that can help you with that um, but it can just really ruin you, you, your brand um, if you're using fuzzy fuzzy images or if you're infringing copyrights or other things so you know please be careful about the images that you share and also something that's it's missed sometimes is actually cross-linking your accounts. So um, I'm going to show you an example of that here. So in Facebook, for example, on your company profile page, in the settings, you can go down and add links to other social accounts. So um, if somebody, sometimes you can't quite get the same names on different platforms. I'm very lucky because um, ours are pretty consistent. It's only just a bit shorter on Twitter because the character limit. But if a business hasn't got that consistency and they've got profiles that they can't sort out with the naming and it's hard for them to be found connecting with their actual business name, things like this are a great way to help people find those to actually connect and link to your other profiles via your your other profiles, if that makes sense. So um, your task here is to think about whether there's a platform or a particular profile even that you need to check over. Maybe it needs an update, maybe it needs expanding. Just write this down as a note to self so that you don't miss step four. You can go back and do that another time. Okay, I'll just give you 30 seconds or so to do that. And I will just add there that I think if you have help with your social media and if you've got somebody else doing it or you're outsourcing it, for example, this overlooking, updating it can happen so easily because you don't go on there as much as, as you would normally. You know, you, you've got the content going out and someone else is doing that for you. You might see it in a schedule at all or something instead, but you're not always going into your profile all the time. So it's always good to go back, just have a little review check things over and see if we can make an improvement. Step five. Now, I'm always asked, how do I know what to say on social media? You know, where, where do people get their content from? Where do they get their ideas and inspiration? So step five is about where to find that inspiration. Now, using your own business and selling your own products can sometimes just seem that your content's a bit too salesy or inward looking. Um, there are plenty of places outside of your business to find inspiration. And there is a great tool called Answer the Public. Now, you get a couple of free searches a day. 
um, on the free version. And you can just go on there and you can type in um, a keyword, for example, and the data it, it pulls out and produces for you either in a wheel format, which is quite nice and visual, or in a spreadsheet, whichever you, you prefer, um, is all based on real search data. So if you're looking for inspiration for a blog content title or something and you want to know what people are actually searching and looking for, Answer the Public is a great tool for that. And now I'm sure there's also some guides out there on how to use it if it's not immediately clear. Um, if you're not familiar with like keyword tools and things, then perhaps it won't be, but it is really simple to use. So do have a look at that. There's also, um, you'll have industry magazines, news, blogs, etc., that you can subscribe to um, or follow for their feeds and their newsletters too. So for example, for, for my business, you know, we include content from places like Enterprise Nation for small businesses, uh, Design Week, Marketing Week, Moz, which is um, an authority on search engine optimization, you know, all kinds of industry um, magazines and names. So you might want to look to the news. Um, you might want to seek inspiration from your, the content your local chamber of commerce are putting out. Maybe there are industry specific trade media titles such as things like Pet Business World or Bakery Business, for example, that will inspire you to write an article on a change in your industry um, or you know, something that's very topical and newsworthy at the moment. It's really important to remember throughout this that social media was designed to be two-way, to be social. So it's very easy to essentially shout at your audience and be constantly pushing content outwards. And that leads to a lack of conversation and a lack of engagement, which ultimately leads to a lack of growth and conversions. So yeah, just a few ideas there um, of places that you can have a look. Um, some general ones like HuffPost and Medium, but also think about your specific industry and where you can seek that information too. Now, to help you further, I want to introduce the four pillars of content. If you've been on a webinar with me before about this kind of topic, then you'll definitely see this because it's a graphic that I really like and um, it's really helpful. So you can create or share different types of content that actually fit in across these four pillars. I'll give you some examples. So obviously my business is a marketing agency. Some of the examples of what we've done across these pillars before are for the entertain. We uh, created a mini Twitter movie from photos and clips that we took going around stands at our local business show. Um, it wasn't this year, um, it was a previous year, but it provided us with a tagging opportunity for those businesses that were included. It also gave us a new type of content to put out and it also extended the life of our attendance at the event as well. In the Inspire corner, well, I'm often speaking at events, so we can post about those. Um, also, there's collaborations that I do, and they're always nice to share information about. There's been a few of those that I've done, you know, both for events, but also on projects and um, for charity as well. Um, in the education bit, well, that's quite easy for us. You know, there's lots of things that we're fortunate to know that people don't know or understand about marketing. So we can share top tips. We can run and promote workshops and webinars to help people. And we've also done live broadcasts as well. Don't do so much of that now. It's not something that's really within my comfort zone. Uh, but I will talk a little bit more about the live side of things later. And then there's um, the, the last quarter there, which is the convince area. And that really serves as proof after you've built some trust up. So things like uh, we share case studies, we share project results, testimonials and reviews, that kind of thing, when you're trying to convince that potential customer that you are going to be awesome to work with. So, of course, the actual content really does depend on your target market, also your style and the image that you want to project. The other rule of thumb is the 80-20 principle. And this is where 20, only 20% 20 of your posts are actually self-promotional or salesy. And the remainder is a mix of the other types of content. Now I did write a while ago, um, a couple of years ago, in fact, um, an article about this on my blog. Maddie's gonna pop the link into the chat in case it helps you just understand that 80-20 principle in relation to content a little bit further. 
So your activity at this stage is to take a couple of minutes to jot down some ideas, content that fits into these four pillars for your business. So perhaps you might even want to make a note of trying something new on one of your profiles that you haven't done before. Um, you could jot down some places that you could subscribe to um, or follow to get that inspiration from. And you can also make a note to check out what national days apply to your, to your business and how you can piggyback these. Um, example off the top of my head is today is World Ballet Day. So there's a hashtag around that. Um, if your business was related to, you know, dance, dance, fair, all those sorts of things, you would absolutely be posting content today that aligned with that, with that national day, that world, that world, that world day. So just take a few minutes to look at that graphic, try and find some ideas for content that fits into those four corners. And I'll be back with you soon. So is it hard to know how long to give people? Um, just give me a thumbs up if you're ready to move on. Yeah, okay, cool. We will do that. Thank you very much. So this is an example um, content plan. And this is step six, where you actually put everything together and you form your content plan to guide you. So you can customize with the columns that you need. For example, in this one, um, yes, it's an old screenshot, but it, it's the same, it's the same, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Um, if you might want to target particular keywords, um, you might have a blog that you're highlighting. You also might always have an offer. You should definitely always have a CTA, which is a call to action in there, um, an essential part of marketing, but there might also be customer offer as well. Um, your social media content plan or the calendar is the perfect place to plan all of your social media activities. So from images that you're going to use to the links that you're going to share, to blog posts, to the hashtags that accompany that post. 
Now it includes both your day-to-day posting, but also content that might be for specific social media campaigns. Your calendar will ensure that your posts are spaced out appropriately as well. So, um, and also published at the best times to post. Do ensure that you determine the right content mix for your business. Make sure that your content strategy and calendar reflect the mission and the goals that you've assigned to each social profile. You know, you might have different goals for each platform so that everything that you post is working to support your marketing activities. Now, this is an example we did a couple of years ago for a client um, which actually tied in their social media content with their with their newsletter plan so she always had she was a holistic therapist she always had a treatment focus there was always a special offer and it made sure that we could put social media posts around and aligned with what was going out to her database so it's just another way of doing it um you know whatever works for you if it's a spreadsheet if you can't stand spreadsheets something more um exciting and graphical totally fine how you want to present it. Why should you plan it? Well, you can choose which platforms to have a presence on um, based on your objectives combined with your why and also who your target audience is. Think about when this target audience is, uses social media and what they're interested in. So what type of content they prefer, who they are in terms of the gender, the age, location, Yes, it's hard, but it's easier for a business that's been trading for a while and has that pool of customer data. Um, it's, it's, I know that it might be sounding like a hefty workload. And I guess, you know, with social media, that is pretty accurate. But, you know, don't try and do it all yourself. Give some responsibility to other people in your team or share the load. Maybe even pay a young family member to, to help you, which can be a good move if you're not comfortable with some of the social media content types like stories or reels, for example. Gen Z are awesome at this stuff. So having grown up amongst, you know, all the technology, technological advances, it's just like, you know, bread and butter to them. I've met lots of business owners whose teenage children actually help them out with the social media content and it works really well for them. So you are planning essentially to not miss opportunities, uh, to not be infrequent and inconsistent, to, to not be off brand, you know, to stay on brand and have everything look brilliant so that you avoid falling behind your competitors. And also so that you just, you know, you don't lack in trust. You know, are people worried about whether you still exist or whether you are still doing a good job for people? Now, of course, we're not going to actually write the content plan right now. Um, so just make a note that step six is to basically pull everything that you've got together so far into that content plan, build it up. And I would say reserve yourself half a day you know, to, to do your first, first version of this. Um, you, can, you can plan ahead for the time that suits you. If you want to plan a couple of weeks ahead and then do it again, you know, that, that's a good, good approach. If you need to do it longer and you're not, um, you've not got, you know, like 50 posts a week to plan, then you can do it for a month or something. But honestly, whatever works for you is totally fine. Um, happy to, you know, share some more advice on that later on. I will now introduce some, some tools to you. So step seven is about finding tools that will maybe help you with a little time saving, um, automation really is becoming increasingly essential. So um, everyone is so busy, especially a small business owner. You don't want to be dipping in and out of social media all the time. You just kind of need to block it out, do it, let it send itself out. Now, are any of these tools familiar? Maybe some. Um, some are scheduling tools. Some are about profile management. Um, and one is actually about design help. I said I'd give you a tool about that. So the one that looks like a bit of a timer there is the Facebook Business Suite. And that was formerly called Facebook Pages Manager. If you own a page or you're in charge of perhaps more than one page on Facebook for a business, that's a really good tool to have. It's just an app on your phone. Canva is awesome. If you're not a designer, and you need um, templates, inspiration, you don't know what size to create things in for the platforms, just register with Canva. The free account will do everything you need. 
if you are um, a bit of a bigger business or you want to make it a bit more easier for yourself, a bit more easier, um, then you can sign up to Canva on a paid account and that will allow you to do things like upload your brand kit so that all of your color hex codes are just right there for you. Um, and you've also got your design assets and your fonts and everything like that. But for a small business, the free, the free account is totally fine. Um, so yeah, just some tools to look at there. Um, I have shown a couple of things from Hootsuite, which is that owl tool, um, just because I see a lot of their content because that's the one that we use. This is a screenshot from inside it. And I would say that scheduling is an absolute must. You know, I, I can recommend uh, Hootsuite, also one called Buffer. There's um, free versions of most of them. The free version of Hootsuite has decreased recently, which is a big shame. It does allow two social channels and scheduling of up to five posts, so it's not much. I have to have a paid account because I've got too many accounts to manage. But it does, um, it allow, allows you to create streams so you can quickly see what's going on across your channels. You can see what you scheduled, you can see what you've posted already, and also who's interacted with that post all in one place. If you're looking for something for Instagram and Pinterest, then there's one called Tailwind that you might want to take a look at. And that will allow 20 posts, I think, um, per month. So just take your task at this stage. Um, I think it's your last class, don't worry. Um, is to note down some of the tools that you think might help you that you're not already using. So it might be some scheduling software. It might be the design tool. Um, to help you create your content, it might even just be your calendar, you know, to get that schedule started. Um, there's other things called uh, TweetDeck, which will help you manage your Twitter activity. If you don't know, obviously, what tool, just write down a tool to help me with X. I'll just give you a minute to do that. Okay. Okay, so moving on. So keys to success. How do you make it all work for you? Um, you definitely need to balance your content. So make sure that you've got that mix, that it's not just promotional. Considered implementation. And by that, I mean, you know, your frequency of posting, the relevancy of everything that you're posting, your visual tone, uh, what features of any platform you're deciding to use. You know, are you using Reels, for example, on Instagram? The voice and the style. Uh, which all comes back to your branding, what's coming through on social media should match that, and you, you should have an internal policy of guidelines on that. And it might be things like, you know, are we using emojis on social media? Are we um, using acronyms either on purpose or accidentally, and blinding people with jargon? Um, that kind of thing. And a lot of small businesses will believe that the social media strategy is simply how often to post and on which channels. And when I'm delivering social media training, this is what I'm asked alongside what on earth do we write about when we have to post like all the time. So this is absolutely an important aspect, but a true social media strategy, as you've seen, goes deeper than that. And it really takes the desired outcomes into account. And that's where the success comes. So larger companies will have an overarching social media strategy, and then they will have aligned strategies for each of the social media strategies. Um, platforms rather that they are using 
Now, if you're just going to have that top line overall strategy, then it needs to include the why you want your brand to be on social media, first of all. And then it goes back to the goals that we were talking about near the start. There are nine objectives that you could have, and you'll likely have more than one. And they might be things like um, to increase brand awareness, to drive traffic to your website, to generate new leads, to grow revenue, to raise branding engagement, to build a community around your business, to provide customer service via social media, to increase your press coverage, um, or to listen to conversations about your brand. And that is a whole art in itself, with, which has its own tools and it's called social listening. Don't think it's something you need to worry about too much if you're a small business, so I haven't covered it today, but just so that you know what that is. Now, I did promise that I would demonstrate what good content looks like. So what does good content look like? Now, aesthetically pleasing is one thing. So Instagram is very visual and it's really good to decide on a style and the type of images that you'll be creating for your grid. And you can see some really good ones right here. Some people do sections that create a larger image too when they're pieced together. And if you want to do something like that, then there are tools to help you do that. Um, for the text part on Instagram, you've got 2,200 characters and up to 30 hashtags limits to play with. Now, a thorough content strategy is brilliantly integrated across lots of channels. So this example I'm gonna go through is from Hootsuite again. Um, one of the social media scheduling tools that I mentioned. So they will create deep, detailed blog content around a subject, any particular relevant subject for their audience. Then within that article, it will link out to other related, relevant and useful articles within their own blog. So I say link out, it's an internal link, but it's linking from that main piece of core content out into like subtopics and, and sub information. They will also embed video in there to support educational points that are made within that blog content. Then if we take a look at, for example, their YouTube channel, it's broken down into content sections, including things like uh, client stories, social media, educational videos, training content, and so on. And well-made video is a key part of the content strategy. And it just simply continues on like that throughout their social channels. So like this post, for example, this tweet um, from Twitter where they're talking about Twitter, but it's linking back to one of their articles. Now, I do understand that this is a big business example and that you're all small businesses, but understanding the needs of your customers and then mapping out content across channels to answer their questions or introduce your solution, your products, is, is an ideal approach to deliver on your strategy. So I hope that you can see that really just the theory around that can totally apply to what you're doing, especially if you've got something like a blog, which is at the heart of your content. I also said I'd talk about live stuff. So a live video post or live stream is one of the features that's on offer on the big platforms. And it is something that you should try and use. So it might sound a bit scary, um, it can definitely feel a bit vulnerable. Um, it essentially turns a broadcast into a conversation. And it doesn't have to be a full length feature film. You can definitely keep it brief. So generally the algorithms will love live content. And that means that they prioritize it in the news feeds and stats have shown that live videos actually get six times more interactions than pre-recorded. So going back to the conversation point, viewers can comment on them. They can like and react during a live. So you're actually getting real feedback and responses in real time. Live content also has this way of just demanding attention. So notifications will pop up and followers feel compelled to click in, in case they miss something. Sometimes lives are scheduled too, of course, and we're going to be, um, you know, doing more lives, hopefully when I get a bit braver. Um, so sometimes when I've got a lot coming up, I'll, I'll hop on Facebook and, and do a live about those things just to highlight them a bit more. But you don't need any special um, equipment. You can just use your smartphone and you can be live within a couple of clicks. So if you're suddenly feeling brave, you can just uh, 
get on and do it straight away. You can even go live on Facebook and Instagram at the same time because they're both owned by Facebook. So do consider what's in your background view. Always important. I think we've all learned that from all of our Zoom conversations over the last year and a half, year and a half or so. Um, make sure there's no background noise as well. People need to be able to hear you and just have a plan. You know, even if it's a few notes on the side, uh, which is what I tend to do so that I don't forget all of the things that I want to say in that video. There is a good guide on how to go live on each of the platforms from different devices, unsurprisingly, on the Hootsuite blog. So there's going to be a link just popped in the chat for you. Again, just about that, okay? So the advertising side of social media might be part of your strategy. Um, it does require some significant budget. Some of you might have already dabbled in it already. If you would like to try out social media ads, it's really important to first think about why you're advertising and what you'd like to achieve. So by setting some goals again, um, you'll have something to measure your, constant, um, your success, I should say, against. And this will also help you when it comes to choosing the right objective if you're getting started with Facebook ads. So some example goals might be that you want to increase your traffic, generate new leads, increase the reach of your posts perhaps on Facebook, or maybe to um, increase the likes for your Facebook page and grow your audience. Um, once you've done that, then you need to go over to the Facebook ads manager. Don't just click boost on Facebook. It gives you a way to advertise very quickly. It's a very quick money maker for Facebook. It doesn't give you brilliant targeting. And it also uses a post that you've just created before. It's not a specifically created advert. So do try and avoid just the boost. Go into the ads manager. All of Facebook ad campaigns run through the tool, which you can access directly at facebook.com slash ads. Really easy to find. Or you can click manage ads in um, the drop down menu on your Facebook account page. Um, so this is the best way to do Facebook advertising. And Facebook will probably continually suggest to you as a page owner that you might like to boost posts. Um, but, you know, it's just not very targeted and it doesn't let you create something, as I say. So when you click to create a Facebook ad, you'll go to a page where you can then choose the objective for your campaign. Can be a bit overwhelming. There's 15 options here alone for what you might want to achieve. And that can be, you know, a bit of a, a scary start. But if you want a breakdown of those, um, there is an article over on Buffer, um, which gives you a guide. Um, and I'll, again, the link will be in the chat for you. Um, all the Facebook business advice, ads advice sections themselves are pretty helpful sometimes um, to get to grips with it. But an ad campaign will usually sit within uh, one of three categories. And that might be awareness. So working with objectives that generate interest in your product or your service. Consideration stage, which is objectives that get people to start thinking about your business, but then look for more information about it. Or conversion. So objectives that are encouraging people already interested in your business to purchase or to use your product or service. The minimum recommended spend is £10 per day, I'd say, for Facebook. You're unlikely to be able to meet your targets for a lower spend than that. And um, the Instagram and Facebook ads can be run simultaneously through the ads manager. If you want to do something like LinkedIn ads, then you need to do that directly through LinkedIn. For Twitter, you can select whether you'd like to promote individual tweets or you can run an entire ad campaign with a specific purpose, just like um, Facebook. And you can target certain interests or certain user types, for example. And before I explain about the different types of measurement, which is the last part of, of the session, I'll just quickly talk about engagement. If you focus on building up a ton of followers, but you forget about engagement, you're going to run into problems. Either you'll end up with, with many low quality followers, more followers than you know what to do with, or you'll struggle to get any followers at all. You must remember that getting engagement widens your net, so it increases your views. So say just 10 of your followers like, comment or retweet to their own following, your content could then be seen by more than 100 additional potential customers. So you can see the expansive reach there. And that reaching increases further when you get into the habit of engaging back by replying to comments, retweeting and so on. Now, Facebook's engagement rate will consist of the total number of clicks 
um, likes, comments and shares. And you can check your engagement on Facebook by opening the insights page for your Facebook page. Then you just select posts. You scroll down to the section titled all posts published, where you'll be able to then see how many people your posts have reached and your engagement data there as well. And you can check insights for individual posts if you want to do that. Now, when your audience rarely engages with your posts, Facebook shows them to fewer people over time. Therefore, you want as much engagement as possible so that your post is shown to as many people as possible. And I do appreciate it's like a chicken and egg situation. Sometimes it's a great idea to just band together a few core customers or supporters to kickstart that engagement for you. On Twitter, the engagement figures are found in the analytics section and they'll be there for up to the, uh, the last 28 days. And on Instagram, Business Insights will show you how popular your post stories and, and reels have been. Here is just some general tips on building social engagement. So, you know, share highly visual content, share emotional content as well, things that are going to resonate with people. Promote your accounts, um, you know, in presentations, in newsletters and, and other places, other marketing. Research the best times to post, which you can do within either existing data or within industry data online. Engage to so say thank you, respond to things, like things. Utilize your hashtags, and you can also research these two. two. There are um, hashtag research tools which will show you whether one particular hashtag um, is more popular over another very similar hashtag. Um, encourage participation as well. So, you know, you can do things like polls. Um, you can ask open questions and, um, and get comments back and replies to that and share promotions as well. And if you want to run competitions and things. So measurement, the most common metrics to analyze the success of a social presence are split into both post level engagement and page level engagement. So post level engagement will include things like likes, shares, and comments. The most basic metrics for social media engagement will track user interactions with each post. They'll tell you whether the post was interesting enough to grab the audience's attention. Clicks are then the next level up. So the number of clicks for each post show a user's interest towards that post. Likes and shares will happen on the social platform. Then the use, a click will send users to your company's page or out to your website which will bring further marketing opportunities. Page level engagement covers the growth of followers and mentions. Measuring the consistency and the number of new followers can help you examine whether the social strategy is successful. So the number of mentions a social profile receives can indicate the success of the content. And then there's analysis of how active a community is. So it's not just about seeing an increase in the number of followers, but also about tracking how active they are and how they react to each post. Each of the platforms provide their own analytics facilities for business profiles, allowing you to check in on performance over time, as we've talked about. You will often see the last month as standard, but you can expand that time frame if you want to. And on Twitter, you can see what your top tweets were, your top follower, how many profile visits you received, amongst other things. Over on LinkedIn, you'll find post analytics, update metrics and mentions, and also um, other expected engagement figures on there too. So with company page analytics, you can even compare your page to similar company, company pages, which will again help you inform your strategy. To monitor the journey of followers from social media to your website and measure ROI, return on investment, Google Analytics is recommended. So if you have a website, you should have this free tool connected to it and you just need to have a free Google account and then verify ownership of your website. Once your account has collected a pool of data, then you'll be able to look at whether social media is actually driving people to your site and then where they are going on there once they're on the site. So that's the end of the main presentation. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about Digital Champions in just a second. Thank you so much for your time and your attention today and your contributions. Feel free to connect with me or my company via any of these methods, or you can sign up to receive our latest blog articles via our newsletter on our website. I'm just going to run that poll that we did at the beginning. 
and let's see if your um, knowledge has improved hopefully hopefully it has so um, bear with me we launch there we go <coughs> Oh, okay, you can split, confident and could be better. So maybe there's a few questions here and that's totally fine. I can answer those at the end. Thank you very, very much for um, sharing your, your results with us. So um, just a little bit about the Coast of Capital a Digital Champions offer. I know we've got a few of them on the session today um, and I am one as well. Um, there is free digital support to help you with your digital digital adoption um, if you're a business in West Sussex. Everyone that comes to these sessions, um, these webinars can get up to eight hours of pre-specialist support from one of seven digital champions, a team of experts and business owners that can help advise you if you need support particular skill set or advice so things like um, you know digital technology strategies uh, training members of your team on digital skills utilizing new technology improving your productivity having the right tech team all of those things are things that we can help you with how do you access it really really easy so you just need to use the contact form at c2cbusiness.org.uk link again is going to be in the chat in a second you can ask any of us here today if you have any questions about that, or you can just drop an email to that email address on the screen right there, growthhub.hub at coastcapital.org.uk with a few details of what you think you need help with. Um, you don't have to know all the answers at the outset. They will help assign the right digital champion to you. As I said, there's seven of us and we can spend a day helping you for free with your business. So do utilize that support. The other things that are on offer is um, partly matched funding for from the business hot house, which is a 60-40, so you pay 40%, they pay 60. Uh, no, that's the way around. You pay 60, they pay 40. Um, you can apply for that funding through them. There's also low case, which will help businesses um, adapt to help, uh, improving their climate change and e um, eco you know, goals, all those sorts of things. Um, I think there's grants available there as well and RISE, which is all about innovation and uh, research products. Do get in touch with any of those if there's something specific that you think that the Digital Champion Support can't help you with, but you would like some support on. Next up in the series, we have got Data, Security and GDPR, which is the later this week. Um, I'll be assisting Jo on that session. She is an absolute expert on GDPR, so I'm sure that there'll be some real gems in there. And I know it's a topic that some people have a bit of a headache over. Um, and then the one after that is all about how to measure your marketing return on investment with Stu and Ollie, the team at Creative Bloom. So do book on to some of the other sessions. And I hope to see you and I hope that was really helpful. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm available to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. So, Maddie, have we, um, is there any questions that popped up earlier that I haven't seen that you want to? Yeah. <clears throat> Ooh, yes, there, there was a couple. Uh... Someone was asking about good video editing platforms, sort of like Canva, but with a more video specific focus. Okay, yeah, 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 there are. Um, the names don't spring to mind um, only because I don't use them, but I can definitely um, send you some. So if you want to just, um, do you know who asked that question? Because I can come back to you. With I can, suggestions. it's a little while back, I've got to scroll back. Okay, that's fine. Um, or just drop me a, a tweet or something. Uh, well, I think it was Vicky. Okay, no worries. Okay. Uh, God, my chat's all small. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Um, someone asking about losing organic reach once they've used paid ads. That was from Matt. Oh, really? Um, yes. Matt, did you want to unmute and um, talk to me a bit more about that? Matt, are you there? Potentially not. Maybe we've lost him. Yeah, I just need to know what the question is. Oh, he's in the chat. Okay. Okay. Um, if you want to um, type a specific question about my internet chat, I think I might get that. Okay. And there's another question there as well. Are there any websites which allow you to see social media growth data, i.e., competitors? Uh, do you mean for your own profiles? I, I think competitors, yeah. There was a couple of questions asking about whether there's any platforms that give you more insight into like uh, competitors' engagement and things. Not that I know of. I think it's a bit of a manual task. Um, mm. I don't know of any that you can do that, but I might be wrong. <laughs> yep, I don't know. Um, Sorry. Is it possible to see growth without any money, spending any money? It is, um, but it requires a great deal of time, lots and lots of engaging content. And I'd say you, you want a real journey there. So you want to be sure on where people are clicking through to, um, where they're signing up to from the content. You make sure everything's integrated. Um, it just takes a long time. But you, yeah, I mean, you can. Um, especially if if your content that you're putting out, say it was in a particular style and it's really captivating people and it goes viral, you know, you could, you could do that in a, in a free, unpaid way. Did you want to ask something, Malcolm? I saw a hand there. <laughs> yeah, um, I've got a question. Um, it's about this uh, this year's sort of big hot topic on social media, which has been the iOS 14 update. All right. Uh, yeah. And I wanted to ask you as a marketer, what what kind of what impact have you seen on people's kind of targeting and or performance and what what possible countermeasures have you employed or deployed or advised on um, yeah. to help people still keep on top of all of their all of their metrics and their performance yeah great question um yes it, it has had a huge impact on on the ad this is on the paid ad side of things because it's all about tracking the conversions um where there's like a, a cookie install um, so what we've done is actually um, we've tended to separate out ad campaigns into iOS campaigns and Android campaigns so that we can look at the measurement slightly differently. Okay. It's mainly affecting those with a longer consideration purchase window. So purchases that aren't just um, a quick put in your basket and buy, but take a bit more thought and consideration because the cookies obviously aren't staying in place long enough. So it needs some proper setup by an ads manager that really, really knows what they're doing with all the right tracking in place. And then, yeah, separating out those campaigns where you need to so that you can do some extra data research on the iOS side to try and pull back some of the data that's being lost uh, through that update. Okay, cool. yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so Vicky, your question, is it just on Facebook? It was actually, it, it's not just on Facebook because it's about the iOS platform cookies. So it's it affects Facebook and other channels, but it's only, re, only where you're, you're spending budget and there's tracking needed. So it's mainly Facebook um, and Instagram. Um, but yeah. I think Matt Another clarified question. his question. I don't know whether that makes sense, but do you know? All right. I, I read online that someone lost their high number of organic likes and they paid for an ad. And then afterwards, the likes dropped massively. Let me just go back to that question. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, I, I don't know about that specific in, instance. It sounds unusual, I, I would say. Um, especially where someone's got to go in and take the action to actually unlike that page. Um, I don't know why an ad that's set to increase things and build things would, would have a negative effect like that. I, you know, I'd really have to have some more detail on it, um, but it's unusual. I, I wouldn't panic or worry about something like that, that happening.
do you still recommend Facebook pages? The engagement seems extremely low, even for pages with millions of followers. You're absolutely right, Lubna. It's an absolute pain because growth is very tricky on Facebook for a business page. It's not designed for businesses to promote themselves and, and get customers. You know, it's a very much a, a people consumer based platform. Um, they want your money, but they're not very good at helping you grow your, grow your following. So again, I would say, yes, you need a presence. I would say, spend more of your strategy and time on the platforms that are generating a bit better return just to maintain that presence on there as part of your strategy overall. Um, and you just need to invest the time where it's right for you. You know, it's all about measurement. How can you find the best time to post on Facebook? And how do you apply the keywords to the page? So the best time to post on, post on Facebook, if you've already got an audience and you go into your insights, you'll be able to see when your customers are most likely to be online and when they're most engaging with your content. Now, the problem comes if that isn't your target audience as such. You know, if you've made a change and actually you're, you're trying to reach a new or altered audience, that data is obviously based on the followers that you've already got. So I would say do some Googling, try and find some benchmarks for your industry um, and do, do it that way. Um, just be aware that, you know, that insight data you're looking at inside the platform is all based on the followers that you already have. In terms of how to apply keywords to the page, um, you can't really on Facebook, to be honest. Um, it's just really about using them within the content. It's not, there isn't like, you know, a, a meta description area or anything like that. It's just about using them in the about section, in your posts, um, in making sure your page is titled appropriately, all of those things. You can't really optimize it as such. Um, so yeah, sorry if I confused you there, but you can do that more so on places like Instagram because you've got the hashtag usage there. Any other questions? All right, so anybody wants to unmute and ask anything? We do have the Q and A session as well at the end of the um, the series. So That's if right. you suddenly think of anything <laughs> after we've ended the session, you could always join on to that and ask something there. Yeah. Well, there's one that's just popped up. Would you say that due to the high number of Facebook ads, people are leaving the site? Um, it's personal preference, isn't it? You know, I think a lot of the trouble is where people are quite adverse to saying yes to cookies on sites, whereas actually that's going to serve you more relevant ads. So, and that's what people don't realise. You know, they, they think that they're going to be spammed with all sorts of things but actually you're going to be presented with things that are more relevant if you, if you agree to those things so um people might be leaving because they're fed up with the amount of advertising and it's just not a platform they're enjoying anymore but it's just we're on really personal preference you can turn things off to a certain extent you know within your settings so yeah Cool. OK, well, thank you so much. Um, we are nearly out of time anyway, so I will let you all go, get some late lunch. Thank you for joining us. Please sign up to some of the other sessions. Please utilise the free support that is on offer to you and connect with any of the digital champions that are on the programme. They're all listed on the Coast Capital sites and all of the Recover and Rise events are listed on Eventbrite. So thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, Rachel. Hey. <clears throat> Yay, I actually filled the time today. Oh. <laughs> very pleased. Oh, that was good. Yeah. yeah. Very pleased. I think loads of questions that time. People seemed really engaged. Yeah, weird questions then. Yeah, some of them were a bit. <laughs> some of them was like, oh. um, I'm actually connected with Vicky, so don't worry. I can um, check out some video tools and send her some of those. Okay. Lovely. Lovely. You have today. No worries. Lovely to see you again, hopefully yes, again soon. You.
Yeah. All right. And have a good lunch. My next one, are you? Because I'm. Oh, I think you've got. So. Yeah. yeah. All right. Maybe well, see have a good you on the last one. Yeah. <laughs> see you later. Right. Bye. Bye.